Okay, so for this session, we're going to discuss IAS 16, Property Plant and Equipment. And for our discussion, this will be uh, the topics or the components of the discussion. We will have the objective and scope. We'll have definitions, recognition criteria. We have initial and subsequent measurement. We have the recognition and we have disclosure. So with that, let us proceed with the objective and the scope first. So the objective of uh, IS-16 is basically to prescribe the accounting treatment for all PPE so that the user can prepare the financial statements or the components of the financial statements with proper discernment okay, with regards to the invested PPE in the, uh, of the company. So the principal issue in accounting for PPE are basically the recognition, the determination of the carrying amount, and the depreciation charge as well as the impairment loss. Kaya doon din iikot yung ating discussion. So with regards to the scope, the standard shall be applied in accounting for PPE except when another standard requires or permits a different accounting treatment. Therefore, in the scope of the standard, there are items that were automatically removed or were not included in the scope of the standard. So first, it will not apply to PPE that are classified as held for sale because it is now going to be accounted for under IFRS 5 once it is classified as held for sale. Letter B, biological assets because this is covered specifically by IAS 41. Also, the standard applies to better plants but it does not apply to the produce of or the produce that we're going to get from the better plant. So generally, similar to when we were discussing IS-41, in IS-41, IS-41 will not account for the better plant, but they will account for the produce on the better plant. In this case, IS-16 will not cover the produce, but it will cover the better plant itself. Also, um, the standard will not cover wasting assets because this is covered by IFRS 6 and it will not also cover mineral rights and mineral reserves such as oil, natural gas and similar non-regenerative resources because it is not considered as PPE. So basically this is going to be, so mineral rights will now be covered by uh, IS 38 which is intangible assets. Or it can also be covered when if when you are talking primarily of the um, of the mineral resources that we're going to extract from the wasting assets, then it will now be part of inventory later on after it is uh, it was extracted from our wasting assets. So generally, um, letter C and letter D will cover IFRS six, IAS thirty eight, IAS two. Okay. Take note, however. However, this standard applies to property, plant, and equipment used to develop or maintain the assets described in letter B to letter D. Okay? So meaning, even though, if you go back, even though biological assets in itself okay, is not covered by the standard, any property, plant, and equipment that are used to maintain the biological assets, to maintain the wasting assets, and to maintain the, re the resources that we're going to extract, these are now covered by our standard. That's why later on, if we are going to discuss IFRS 6, any machinery that is going to, that is being used in the extraction process, they are going to be treated as either as part of the wasting asset or as a separate uh, PPE depending on the criteria as provided by IFRS 6. So it's a case-to-case -case basis. Let's proceed. We now go to the definitions. So the first item that we're going to define is better plant. Uh, the better plant was already defined in IS 41, but we're just going to uh, read it back for purposes of reiteration. So a better plant is a living plant that is used in the production or supply of agricultural produce. It is expected to bear produce for more than one period, and it is... Uh, uh, very remotely uh, likely 
that it is going to be sold as agricultural produce except for incidental scrap sales only. Meaning, it is not being cultivated for purposes of being sold. It Eventually, it may be sold but it is basically just a scrap sale or it is just an incidental sale because it is no longer usable as a bearer plant. Next definition is carrying amount which is the amount of an asset that is recognized after deducting any accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. This is also defined previously in our um, IS41. Next, we have cost, which is the amount of cash or cash equivalents paid or the fair value of other considerations given to acquire an asset at the time of its acquisition or construction or where applicable, applicable the amount attributed to that asset when initially recognized in accordance with the specific requirements of other IFRSs, example, share-based payments. Okay? So, meaning the cost of an asset will be dependent on the amount that was given up at the time of the acquisition of the property plant. Next, Next we have depreci uh, depreciable amount. So, depreciable amount is the cost of an asset or the other amount substituted for cost less its residual value. So meaning the amount that can only be uh, recognized as depreciation later on. Depreciation pertains to the systematic allocation of the depreciable amount of an asset over its useful life. We have entity-specific value, which is pertaining to the present value of the cash flows that an entity expects to arise from the continuing use of an asset and from its disposal at the end of its useful life or expects to, in, uh, to incur when settling a liability. So entity-specific value generally uh, is termed as a value in use. So it's uh, basically interchangeable. Entity-specific value and value in use are almost the same. Generally, they can be inter interchangeable. Fair value pertains to, again, um, in the absence of any other information, the fair value will be based on the definition of IFRS 13. So again, it is the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. And then we have impairment loss. So impairment loss is the amount by which the carrying amount of an asset exceeds its recoverable amount. We have property, plant, and equipment which is defined as tangible items that are held for use in the production or supply of goods or services for rental to others or for administrative purposes and are expected to be used du uh, during more than one period. So you might be looking into this item, it says here, for rental to others. So you might be asking, sir, I thought that items that are for rent are supposed to be considered as investment property. The answer is not ev not all items that are held for rentals are investment properties. Why? Because some are considered as PPE, particularly if they are equipments or equipment or items that do not qualify as investment property because investment property only covers land and buildings. Also, uh, not all land and buildings that are being rented out are considered as intangible or sorry, as uh, investment property because it is it is also dependent on the degree or the amount of the ancillary services in relation to the total amount of the rentals. So it is possible that a property is uh, held for rental purposes but it is not an investment property because the ancillary services are significant in relation to the amount being paid by the tenants. Okay? Next, we have recoverable amount which is... Uh, Higher, the higher amount between the fair value less cost to sell or cost of disposal and its value in use. So generally, value in use is the entity-specific value. Okay, let's proceed. What's next? So we have residual value. Now, okay, residual value pertains to the estimated amount that an entity would currently obtained from disposal of the asset after deducting the estimated cost of disposal if the asset were already of the age and in condition expected at the end of its useful life. Okay? So, basically, residual value is the amount that you expect to uh, get whenever you're going to sell the asset already. Or generally, this is the net 
uh, disposal proceeds that we're going to get. Useful life pertains to the period over which an, ent- an asset is expected to be available for use by an entity or the number of production or similar units expected to be obtained from the asset by an entity. So useful life can be um, can be termed or can be described in terms of number number of years or it can or it can be defined in terms of productive capacity. That's why we have various depreciation methods depending on the uh, useful life or the kind of useful life that is being used for such per- for, for such particular asset. So with that, we can now proceed with the recognition. So for the recognition criteria, the standard is very straightforward. It simply says there, the cost of an item of property, plant, and equipment shall be recognized as asset if and only if, letter A, it is probable that future economic benefits associated with the item will flow to the entity and the cost of the item can be measured reliably. So if you look into the recognition criteria, it is very simple that for as long as number one, the definition of PPE was satisfied, and number two, both A and B are satisfied in the recognition criteria, then the item will be recognized as property, plant, and equipment. In terms of initial cost, the standard also provides that an items of property, plant, and equipment may be acquired for safety or environmental reasons, and the acquisition of such PPE, although it will not directly increase the future economic benefits of a particular PPE, it is necessary for the entity to obtain future economic benefits. So meaning, the standard simply says that although there are certain items of property, plant, and equipment that will not directly result to uh, an inflow or because if you look into this one there is there is letter a there meaning that the benefits will flow to the entity correct now there are certain items that will not directly provide us with inflows but it is necessary or essential for us to obtain economic benefits that's why according to the standard if we are going to acquire additional property plant and equipment or additional items that qualify as property, plant, and equipment, even though they will not provide direct economic benefits, they are still recognized as PPE because they are necessary for us to obtain the economic benefits. Like for example, if let's say, for example, you are operating a chemical plant or a factory, in order for you to safely operate that factory, you are going to acquire or you are going to um, establish safety equipment, safety facilities, and other safety mechanisms within that particular factory that will make it safe for the entity to produce the chemicals that are going to be produced. And these chemicals are generally the those that will generate uh, future economic benefits. So the concept here is the safety equipment or the environmental equipment that are being added to the main PPE can also be recognized as separate property plant and equipment because they are needed in order for the entity to produce economic benefits later on. So that's basically the concept there. Aside from the initial costs that are related to the preparation of the PPE, for its intended location and condition, we also have sub- subsequent costs. Okay, So the standard specifically states that day-to-day cost of servicing the item is not capitalizable. And the only time that an entity can recognize subsequent cost is when the subsequent cost will meet the criteria of property, plant, and equipment. We also discussed before that for an, for a, an item of cost, to be considered as capitalizable either separately or as an integral component of the initial property plant and equipment, we need to make sure that these are considered as enhancements or improvements. And enhancements are generally obtained when we meet either of the three or one of the three 
items wherein enhancements or improvements will be achieved through number one increase in productive capacity number two is increase in useful life or number three is decrease in operating cost okay so those three are the general criteria or general items that can help us determine whether our subsequent cost can be capitalized or not okay so with that we can now proceed with our initial measurement so now that we are sure that the item that we are trying to account for covers your is 16 or our property plant and equipment the next thing that you're going to do now is to measure it. So the question there is, how are we going to measure our property, plant, and equipment? And the answer there is, it depends on whether we are talking about initial or subsequent measurements. So of course, during initial measurement, the standard specifically says that we are supposed to measure initially the property plant and equipment at cost okay so since we are talking about cost the standard also provides us with the elements of cost so according to the standard these are the elements of cost first is purchase price which includes import duties and non-refundable purchase taxes after deducting trade discounts and rebates again when we talk about trade discounts and rebates this pertains to trade discounts and rebates, whether taken or not. So meaning we are supposed to compute for the purchase price at net amount. So regardless of whether the company was able to avail of the rebates or not, the rebates are still going to be netted off or deducted from the initial purchase price or the total purchase price of the item. Letter B, any cost directly attributable to bringing the asset to the location and condition necessary for it to become capable of operating in the manner intended by management. So these are what we call directly attributable costs. And we have letter C, which are estimated costs of dismantling or restoring. We also know we also call this as the commissioning cost. So of course, this should be computed immediately uh, at the time the PPE was acquired. Okay? If the cost was not initially capitalized, then uh, it, it, there, it is not possible for you to capitalize it any longer if you, only, uh, if you were only able to determine it after initial recognition. So the initial estimate of the cost of dismantling and removing of the item and restoring the site on which it is located Okay, will be capitalizable and the obligation for which an entity incurs either when the item is acquired or as a consequence of having used the item during a particular period for purposes other than to produce inventories during that period. So for short, dismantling cost, um, re uh, restoring cost, or decommissioning cost. So again, this amount should be determined at the time of the initial recognition of the item so again components are purchase price any directly attributable cost and your decommissioning cost however of course when we talk about uh, directly attributable cost we cannot say that everything is a directly attributable cost so we need to um, determine specifically what are examples of directly attributable cost so according to the standard these are some examples the list is not exhaustive so this means that you can still add other items for as long as you can justify that these are costs that are directly related to bringing the asset to its intended location and condition so first we have cost of employee benefits arising directly from the construction or acquisition of the item of property and equipment okay so meaning if you paid your employees or the amount that you paid to your employees in relation to the preparation of the PPE that you acquired. That's a capitalizable cost. Letter B, cost of site preparation. So the amount that you spent in order for you to prepare 
the location or to prepare the area where you are going to install the PPE. Letter C, initial delivery and handling cost. Letter D, installation and assembly costs. We have letter E, cost of testing, whether the asset is functioning properly, okay? i.e. assessing whether the technical and physical performance of the asset is such that it is capable of being used in the production or supply of goods or service for rental or for administrative purposes and letter F, professional fees. Okay, so those are some components of directly attributable cost. Now, uh, we need to uh, reiterate in this case that particularly in the process of testing, if in the process of testing you were able to produce samples or you were able to produce particular um, inventory in relation to testing the PPE, whatever proceeds uh, or amount that you're going to derive from that particular test outputs will now be deducted from the cost associated with the testing. So your, it is going to be netted off. Similarly, um, since we are talking about site preparation, site preparation will usually involve demolition cost. Again, whenever there are scraps that were obtained from the demolition of a particular site, the said um, scraps or the proceeds from the scraps will be deducted from the cost of site preparation or the cost of demolition. And of course, since we are talking about that, the, the, the demolition cost net of the scrap sales it will be capitalized either to the building or to the land depending on the reason for the demolition. Okay? So to, re, to clear that out, what, what are we trying to say? Um, it simply means that if let's say, for example, the demolition was uh, done in order to simply make sure that the land is okay or to simply make sure that the that the land is safe and that the land is suitable for future projects then the capital or the demolition cost net of the scrap um, net of the scrap proceeds will be capitalizable to the land however if the reason for demolition is because you are now going to start uh, building or constructing a building in that particular area that you are preparing, then the demolition cost is now capitalizable to the building itself. Okay? So again, it depends on the reason or the purpose of demolition. Okay? So those are examples of attributable cost. In this slide, however, uh, the item or the standard also provided us with examples of costs. Okay? that are not to be classified as I, part of items of PPE. So first is cost of opening a new facility. Letter B, cost of introducing a new product. Letter C, cost of conducting business in a new location. And letter D, administration and other general overhead costs. So these are not capitalizable. Okay. However, again, to reiterate, if the administration and uh, overhead costs are directly attributable to preparing the asset, so example, you are you are using the time of administration and other uh, overhead employees, and the time that they are spending is directly related to the preparation of the PPE, then that can now be classified as capitalizable but in the case that the problem did not specifically provide for that the problem simply stated administration and general overhead cost then do not capitalize the said cost okay because in order for an item to be capitalizable to an item of ppe we should be sure that it is directly related to preparing the said ppe okay to continue, the following costs are not included in the carrying amount of an item of PPE. First is the cost incurred while an item capable of operating in the manner intended by management has yet to be brought into use or is operated at less than full capacity. So meaning, if the item is already 
um, established and it is already capable of operating but the company is not yet operating it at full capacity the cost incurred okay with that in relation to that particular scenario is not capitalizable anymore okay why because the asset is already established you can now use the asset but the thing here is the asset or the company is not yet using it at full capacity or is not yet using it at all so meaning any cost that you are using there okay while uh, to maintain the asset while it while it is not yet being used although it is already prepared then it is not capitalizable but rather it is going to be uh, expensed outright letter b initial operating losses we already know that that initial operating losses are not capitalizable that's similar with intangible or sorry uh, similar with investment property and letter c cost of relocating or reorganizing part of all of an entity's operations because these are not considered as um, capitalizable cost to bring the asset to its intended location or condition. Okay, so relocating and reorganizing is not considered as items of PPE. Like example, um, because you are going to, example, you're just renting the property and due to the fact that the owner of the property you are renting out does not want you to renew the lease anymore so you need to look for a new place so what you're going to do is of course you need to remove all your ppe and transfer it to another area or to, a, to another rented space so the the cost that you're going to incur to relocate your business or to reorganize either part or your entire operation does not or is not considered as a capitalizable cost. Rather, these are going to be expensed outright. Okay? So, the thing now is to account for how we are going to measure the cost. Okay? So, according to the standard, the cost of an item of PPE is the cash price equivalent at the recognition date. If payment is deferred beyond normal credit terms, the difference between the cash price equivalent and the total payment is recognized as interest over the period of credit unless such interest is capitalized in accordance with IS-23, which is borrowing cost, which we will be discussing in the next session. So the basic concept of cost is that what we need to focus, uh, what we need to focus in this particular case is to determine the cash price equivalent. And what are the evidences of cash price equivalent? Generally, it's going to be the cash selling price. It can be the present value also. Okay? So that's basically how you're going to determine the cash price equivalent. So it's either uh, how much is it is going to be sold at cash price and how much it is, it is going to be um, or how much is the present value of the total computations in case there is deferred payments. And... According to this uh, provision of the standard also, uh, interest in relation to deferred payments is generally going to be recognized as expense unless the PPE plus is qualified or, or the interest is qualified for capitalization under the provisions of IAS 23, which is borrowing cost. Next, in the case of exchange of non-monetary assets, the cost of such an item of PPE is measured at fair value unless letter A, the exchange transaction lacks commercial substance or the fair value of neither the asset received nor the asset given up is reliably measurable. So according to the provision, what if you acquired your PPE and it is not and the, uh, the amount that you exchanged for this particular PPE is not cash? Okay, so this means that you exchange it for non-monetary asset. So the question there, or non-monetary items, I mean. So the question there is, what are you going to do? So what you're going to do is to determine first whether there is a commercial substance and whether the fair values are available. Because, um, because it, for different scenarios, there will be different treatments also. Okay, so let us um, elaborate on the provisions. Okay, so what are the possible what are the possible 
exchanges that we're going to encounter. Number one, exchange of PPE. So you will get PPE and you're going to exchange it for another non-monetary asset. Let's say, for example, another PPE. So PPE for PPE or non-monetary asset for another non-monetary asset. So in this case, you need to determine first if there is commercial substance. And if there is commercial substance, then we are going to determine the fair value. Okay? And the rule, okay, the rule in case of, the rule that we're going to apply in case of exchanges, okay? So let's just type it here so that we can be clear about that. For a while, I'll just look for the slide and update it. Okay, so in this case, if there is an exchange, okay, so we are going to apply the GRG rule. Okay, G, R, and then G. So what we are going to do first, if there is commercial substance, is we are going to get the fair value of asset given up. Plus cash paid plus cash received. Okay. And then R is fair value of asset received. And finally, the last G is book value of asset even up plus cash paid less cash received this is the hierarchy of how you are going to apply the concept okay so you need to follow this particular hierarchy so the first if you're going to exchange another non-monetary asset for your PPE then first thing that you need to do is to determine whether there is commercial substance. If there is commercial substance, then you follow the hierarchy. Okay? So you get the fair value of the asset that you gave up. If it is available, then you add the cash that you paid and you deduct the cash that you received. If, if the first uh, item of priority is not available, then you go to the next one. So in this case, you're going to get the fair value of the asset received. Okay? And if this is not available, then you go to the last item, which is you're going to base the amount or the cost of the PPE that you acquired. You base it on the book value of the asset that you gave up plus cash, the cash that you paid less cash that you received. Okay? If there is no commercial substance, then you ignore the fair values. You simply go to the book value. The reason is because since there is no commercial substance, then the values of the two assets that were exchanged are basically the same. So that's how it's going to work. Next, how do we know if there is commercial substance? So according to the standard, there is commercial substance if any, okay, any of the three was satisfied. So first, the configuration or the risk, timing, and amount of the cash flows of the asset received differs from the configuration of the asset or the cash flows of the asset transferred. So meaning there is a difference in the cash flow configuration of the assets that were received and exchanged. Letter B, the entity-specific value or the value in use of the portion of the entity's operations affected by the transaction changes as a result of the exchange. So meaning because um, if we say, for example, because I received a different PPE as compared to the old PPE that I have, so there was an exchange, the value in use of the entire operations is now significantly changed, so meaning there is commercial substance. But if after the exchange, the entity-specific value or value in use is basically the same, then there is no commercial substance. And letter C, the difference in A or B is significant relative to the fair value of the assets exchange. So in order for you to say that there is commercial substance, you need to either establish A or B. And after establishing A or B, 
you need to establish letter C that it is significant. The question now is, how do we know if the cash flow or the the the, comer, the, the substance or the commercial substance is significant? That's the that's the problem with our standard because it was, it was not established. Again, our standard is principles based and not rules based. So what are you going to do? It's a matter of judgment again between the parties. If if they consider 10% to be significant already, then they can say that there is commercial substance. So um, that's why in in case of or during the board examination, the problem will specifically just give you an idea that there is commercial substance or there is no commercial substance. Because um, having commercial substance is a case-to-case -case basis depending on the thresholds that were established by one entity. So it differs from one entity, one entity to another because they have different materiality thresholds. So for board examination and problem-solving purposes, um, you simply need to check the information given by the problem to determine if there is commercial substance or there is not. Okay. Next. Still for measurement of cost, the standard also gave us this particular provision. It says there the fair value of an asset is reliably measurable if letter A, the variability in the range of reasonable fair value measurements is not significant for that asset or letter B, the probabilities of the various estimates within the range can be reasonably assessed and used when measuring fair value. Because just like what we said again previously, your fair value can be level 1, level 2, or level 3. According to the standard, the fair value is reliably measurable at, the, at a minimum Okay, of, because of course, if there is already market value, then that's already the that's already the fair value that we're going to use. But if in case the fair value is not a single amount, then you need to check the range. Okay, so first in letter A, if the variability is not significant, okay, meaning it is within a particular reasonable range. Like example, if if we talk about one fifty one hundred fifty between 150 to 300 that's not, that's a very large variability already okay so most probably if we talk about a an insignificant variability it should be if let's say for example maybe around 10 percent variability that's still acceptable but the concept here again is it depends on the entity that is trying to determine the variability because for some entities and for some assets a 10% variability is already large so or it may be significant so they might consider only a variability of 5% or or lower so again it depends from one entity to one entity to another but the concept here is um both parties must be able to agree that the range is not significant okay or letter b the probabilities of the various estimates within the range can be reasonably assessed and used when measuring the fair value. So meaning there should be um, established probabilities and the probabilities that are used are all uh, are all ex possible, possibly expected okay, when the fair value is being computed now. Okay, so to reiterate and to emphasize, fair value could either be a single amount or it can be a range of amounts. In case it is a range of amounts, you need to establish that the range okay, is not significant or the difference between the ranges are not significant and the ranges okay, have certain probabilities that are established so that we can compute for the fair value. Okay. Still considering the measurement of cost under initial measurement, the carrying amount of an item of PPE may be reduced by government grants in accordance with IS-20, okay, which is accounting for government grants and disclosures of government assistance. So before we proceed with the subsequent measurement, let us just go back to our initial measurement. So under initial measurement, we need to understand that 
the component of or that our PPE must be initially measured at cost. And when we talk about cost, it pertains to the net purchase price, the directly attributable cost, and the decommissioning cost. In terms of the purchase price, we already stated that the purchase price, or, uh, sorry, purchase price must be based on the cash price equivalent or the present value of deferred payments. All right? That is in the case of cash transactions or transactions wherein there is going to be cash payment. However, if there is no cash payment, meaning there is going to be an exchange, in the case of exchange, we need to make sure that we know first what are the items that are being exchanged because there are basically uh, different possibilities or different items that can be exchanged. Like it can be the PPE can be exchanged for another asset or another non-monetary asset. It can be exchanged for shares of stock. It can also be exchanged for liabilities. So, in the case of exchanges for another non-monetary asset, we need to determine first if there is commercial substance. And once we determine if there is commercial substance, we need to determine the fair values available. And we are going to use the GRG rule in that case. If we have your liabilities or if you have your equity, Still, we are going to focus on the fair values. But of course, we need to determine the fair values that are more clearly determinable in the case of that particular transaction. Okay? So how do we determine the fair value that is more clearly determinable? Of course, you go back again to the provisions of IFRS 13. And if let's say, for example, the fair value of the equity that was exchanged is only a level to fair value while the fair value of the PPE that we acquired is based on a level 1 fair value so what are we going to use are we going to use the level 2 or the level 1 of course we will base it on the level 1 because it is more clearly determinable take note level 1 level 2 level 3 level 1 in in the case of the provisions of IFRS 13 is still the best okay so you you, you choose the more reliable and more clearly determinable fair value in the case of exchanges. Right? So with that, we now proceed with subsequent measurement. So the standard states that after initial measurement, you have a choice to whether use the cost model or the revaluation model as your accounting policy and, should, and you should apply that policy to an entire class of property, plant, and equipment. So, entire class, okay? meaning not to all PPE but to an entire class. So, of course, property, plant, and equipment will have di different subcategories. We will uh, present that later on. So, for each class of property, plant, and equipment, only one model must be applied. Okay? Of course, with few exceptions, particularly when even if you try to, let's say for example, for land, uh, you you chose to use revaluation model, okay? But the problem is one of your property, one of your land does not have a cur uh, currently does not have fair value, so of course you cannot use revaluation model in that case. So you just provide an exception, or you disclose the exception to that particular application, okay? So uh, let us first proceed with the definition of the cost model. So under the cost model. You are simply going to get the cost of the asset and then it is going to be uh, deducted or there will be deductions for any accumulated depreciation and accumulated impairment loss. So that's basically the carrying amount of the asset subsequent to initial measurement. You get the cost, you deduct depreciation and impairment losses. For revaluation model, however, so what you're going to do is to Recognize the asset initially at cost, and then subsequently you look for the fair value, okay, that can be measured liably, and it shall be carried at revalued amount being its fair value at the date of revaluation less any subsequent accumulated depreciation and sub uh, subsequent accumulated impairment loss. So it's basically what we are trying to uh, determine in or the amount that we're trying to get in revaluation model is the depreciated fair value. Okay? So you get the fair value and then you compute for the for any subsequent depreciation and impairment loss. Okay? 
So it says here, evaluation shall be made with sufficient regularity to ensure that the caring amount does not differ materially from that which would be determined using fair value at the end of the reporting period. So in this case, if the if you if the company chose to use revaluation model, then the minimum okay, frequency of revaluation should be at least once a year and usually uh, near or at, at least at the end of the reporting period so that the amount that is being reported for purposes of financial statement or year-end financial statements or annual reports is the uh, most relevant and most accurate fair value. But according to the standard, since the standard did not provide us with how, how often really, you can actually revalue your PPE as often as you want. But of course, the minimum is by the end of the reporting period, the amounts are already revalued at its peak. It at, at, at its most, most recent fair value already. Okay? So again, still under revaluation model, if an item of PPE is revalued, the entire class of PPE to which the asset belongs shall be revalued also. Okay? So meaning, if let's say for example, you are really using cost model for your buildings. However, one of your building was revalued. Okay? So this means that there will now be inconsistency in your accounting policy if only one of your building was revalued. So for purposes of satisfying the requirement of the standard, since one item in the entire class was already revalued, the entire class or the entire items within the same class should also be revalued already. Okay? So it, it is not supposed to be uh, there, there should and in this case there will be no exception, okay? Because you need to follow it, unless again there are really properties within your within one class that does not have a fair value, and therefore it is not possible for you to determine the uh, revalued amount, okay? But generally, um, as a general rule, if one item within the class was already revalued, the entire items within that group should be revalued also. Okay, so since we are talking about classes of PPE, so that we will not be um, we will not be confused later on, these are the basic examples of the classifications or groupings. So we have land. Generally, land and buildings, or basically, this will now part be part of buildings already because there's already a land. Okay, so we have buildings, we have machinery, we have ships, aircrafts, motor vehicles, furniture and fixture, office equipment, or other types of equipment, and then better plants. So this is just examples of classes of property, plant, and equipment. The point here is in well, within the grouping that the entity um, that the entity is imposing or that the entity is applying within its a particular accounting reporting um, they need to make sure or the entity needs to make sure that only a single accounting policy for PPE is used for each class so meaning it is possible for classification A to be cost model, classification B to be revaluation model, classification C to be cost model, and then all others to be revaluation model. Okay, For as long as you satisfy the rule that for each class or each grouping, one accounting policy should only be used. Okay? Again, still under subsequent measurement, if an asset scaring amount is increased, as a result of revaluation, what are you going to do? The increase shall be recognized in other comprehensive income and accumulated in equity under the heading revaluation surplus. However, the increase shall be recognized in profit or loss to the extent that it reverses a revaluation decrease of the same asset previously recognized in profit or loss. So what are we trying to say here? This simply means that whenever there is a revaluation increase, Prior to recognizing revaluation surplus, we need to make sure first that any reversal of previous impairment losses were already recognized in PNL. And then any remaining revaluation increase will now be recognized in uh, OCI and in directly in equity 
uh, after all uh, impair- impairment reversals were already recognized. So similar to our examples uh, in investment property, if let's say for example, the carrying amount currently is 5 million and then it was rev- the revalued amount was already 8 million, okay? Supposedly 8 million minus 5 million, the 3 million will already be equal to the revaluation surplus. However, prior to recognizing the entire amount as revaluation surplus, you need to ask yourself first, were there supposed to be reversals of previous impairments? So, when you looked into the records, there was a previous impairment of 500,000. So, meaning, before you recognize any impair or any revaluation surplus, you need to reverse first the 500,000 impairment loss. So, meaning, out of the 3 million, you deduct the 500,000 reversal of impairment loss because that will be presented in PNL. Then the remaining 2,500,000 will be presented as revaluation surplus. Okay, so that's how uh, we interpret the provision of the standard. Also, if an asset scaring amount is decreased as a result of revaluation, the decrease shall be recognized in profit or loss also. However, the decrease shall be recognized in other comprehensive income to the extent of any credit balance existing in the revaluation surplus in respect of that asset. The decrease uh, recognized in other comprehensive income reduces the amount accumulated in equity under the heading revaluation surplus. So what does this mean again? So let's do a let's do a different uh, interpretation now. So what happens if there is a revaluation decrease? So let's say the item is carried at 8 million and it is now currently um, valued at 6 million. So meaning there is a 2 million difference. Okay, according to the standard, the 2 million difference should be recognized in profit or loss. However, before recognizing the 2 million as part of profit or loss, determine first if there is still a balance of revaluation surplus. Because that will reduce the amount that we, that will be recognized in profit or loss as impairment. Okay? So again, let's try to make additional information. So when you looked into the records of the company, there is a 1 million balance in the revaluation surplus. So meaning, from 8 million down to 6 million, there should be an impairment loss of 2 million. However, there is a 1 million balance in revaluation surplus. So that will reduce the amount that will be recognized as impairment. So now the 2 million less the 1 million balance in revaluation surplus, which will now be eliminated, then the amount of impairment loss to be recognized in profit or loss will only be 1 million. Okay, so that's how we apply the provisions of the standard. Okay? Next, we proceed with depreciation. So according to the standard, each part or item of PPE with a cost that is significant in relation to the total cost of the item shall be depreciated separately. Okay? So, um, the standard simply says that you can depreciate an item individually or you can depreciate each significant component of a PPE item uh, separately depending on um, the relevance or depending on how the item is being used. So there is no restriction as to how depreciation will be done. Okay, for as long as you can justify that this component must be uh, depreciated differently from the other components. So it's up to you. Okay, so you can depreciate it as a whole or you can depreciate it by, um, by significant parts or by significant components for as long as you can justify the depreciation charge for each period shall be recognized in profit or loss unless it is included in the carrying amount of another asset. Okay? Meaning, the depreciation is either going to be part of depreciation expense or it is going to be capitalizable to another asset. Particularly, if the depreciation is part of the capitalizable cost of another item. Example, the depreciation of a factory equipment is actually a capitalizable cost of your inventory because it is part of factory overhead. So that's basically what it means. 
for the depreciable amount and the depreciation period, okay, the standard states the following. The depreciable amount of an asset shall be allocated on a systematic basis over its useful life and the residual value of the and the useful life of an asset shall be reviewed at least at each financial year end and if expectations differ from previous estimates the changes shall be accounted for as a change in accounting estimate in accordance with ISA so what are what are we trying to say here you are now depreciating the asset okay whenever there are significant changes either in the residual value or the useful life okay because you because of your uh, evaluations and because of your review then you need to apply the change as a change in accounting estimate and according to ISA, changes in accounting estimate must be accounted for currently and prospectively. So meaning it will not affect the previous periods, it will only affect the current report and the future reports if applicable. Okay? It says here, all the following factors are considered in determining the useful life of an asset. So these are, these are some of the considerations. Of course, these are not exhaustive. But these are some of the factors that we're going to consider. First, expected usage of the asset. Okay, of course, that is one of the main determinant of your useful life. Uh, or, uh, how are you expecting to use it? Letter B, expected physical wear and tear, which depends on the operational factors. Okay, so for letter A, this could be based on... Um, expected capacity or physical output so it depends on how many units were already produced letter b it pertains to the expected wear and tear so this pertains to the um inputs okay or the um the operational hours that was already used up in a particular asset okay letter c technical or commercial obsolescence arising from the changes or improvements in production so you also need to consider this. Like example, um, you you expect to use the asset initially for 10 years. However, due to the existence of uh, a new uh, equipment or a new facility or a new technology that is more efficient, you expect to uh, use only the old equipment or the old facility at Four years or so so meaning you're now going to revise your useful life based on the technical or commercial obsolescence available and we also have letter d legal legal or similar limits on the use of the asset such as expiry dates of related leases okay so example you only list the warehouse okay and the warehouse has a lease term of let's say for example 10 years only so when you have the lease or when you have that warehouse, it is going to be capitalizable and uh, depreciated over the lease term only. Of course, again, since we are talking about lease term, we only consider the effective lease term, which is the existing plus the extensions that are expected to be uh, that, that are expected to be agreed upon by both parties or the those that are uh, probable as to extension. Okay. Now, for the depreciation method, the problem or the standard did not provide us with specific depreciation methods, but guidelines were provided. The standard simply says, the depreciation method used shall reflect the pattern in which the asset's future economic benefits are expected to be consumed by the entity. So, it can be straight line, it can be SYD, it can be output, input method, double declining, whatever. Any type or any depreciation method will be accepted for as long as you can justify that it is reflective of the pattern in which the assets future economic benefits are expected to be consumed. Okay? The depreciation method applied to an asset shall be reviewed at least at each financial year end and if there has been a significant change in the expected pattern of consumption, then you now apply again IAS 8 change in accounting estimate. Okay? So meaning, there is a possibility for you to change from one depreciation method to another depending on the changes also in the uh, pattern of uh, the expected benefits okay? relating to the PT. And of course, whenever there is a change, 
it is considered as a change in accounting estimate and therefore it is going to be applied currently and prospectively, meaning it will only affect the current reports and the future reports. No need to revise the previous year reports. Okay. Impairment, this will be discussed um, separately. But however, since it is provided in IS 16, let us provide an overview of impairment. Okay, so to, to determine whether an item of PPE is impaired, the entity will apply the provisions of IS 36, wherein the standard explains that there will be an impairment if there is already a difference or a significant difference between the carrying amount of the asset and its recoverable amount, meaning the carrying amount is higher than the recoverable amount. So in that case, the difference is considered to be an impairment loss. So there will be a separate discussion of uh, impairment. Okay? And since we're talking about impairment, let us talk about compensation for impairment. So in case there is compensation from third parties for impairment, okay, lost or uh, given up assets, it will be included in profit or loss when the compensation becomes receivable. In other words, the compensation for impairment will be recognized separately and it should not affect our computation for the impairment itself. So meaning, if we were able to compute that the impairment was 1 million, then the impairment loss of 1 million will be recorded in full regardless of whether there is an expected compensation for the impairment or not. Because in case there is a compensation for impairment, it will be recognized separately as a gain. Okay, gain on impairment compensation. So the gain for compensation and the impairment itself will be recognized separately. So the compensation for impairment will not affect the amount of impairment that will be recognized in profit or loss. Okay, so from there, we now proceed with the recognition. So generally, the, rec the recognition as provided also in the framework, it pertains to the uh, removal of an item in the financial statement. Okay, And according to the standard, the carrying amount of an item of PPE shall be the recognized letter A upon, dispo upon disposal or letter B when no future economic benefits are expected from its use or disposal. So it's either A upon disposal itself or letter B when there are no more future economic benefits. Okay? So in the case of disposal, the gain or loss arising from the recognition shall be included in profit or loss if there are any disposal gains or losses. Okay? When the item is recognized. Unless IFRS 16 leases requires otherwise on a sale and leaseback. Okay? Of course, Sale and leaseback transaction pertains to the recognition and then recognition as another form of asset. But since if we're going to talk about the usual, the recognition of PPE, then the item will now be simply, or the difference at the time of disposal will simply be reported as either gain or loss. And gains shall not be classified as revenue. Gains shall not be classified as revenue, meaning it will be recognized as other income. Why? Again, to reiterate, revenue pertains to income coming from ordinary course of business. So if there is a gain on disposal of PPE, that is not a, that is not a gain coming from the ordinary course of business. So it will not be classified as revenue. Rather, it will be classified as other income. Okay? It's just so uh, revenues and other income will not be mixed up with each other. Okay? The gain or loss arising from the recognition of an item of PPE shall be determined as the difference between the net disposal proceeds, if any, and the carrying amount of the item. Okay? So that's straightforward. So with that, after you recognize, the last item that we're going to discuss now will be disclosure. So these are the things that needs to be seen in the notes to the financial statement pertinent or in the pertinent information relating to your PP. So according to the standard, these are the things that as general, as general disclosures, these are the things that needs to be seen. First, the measurement basis used for determining the gross carrying amount or basically how did you arrive at the, uh, at the initial cost of the asset or of the PPE. Letter B, the depreciation methods used. Letter C, the useful lives 
or the depreciation rates used. Okay? Because it's either you are using the useful life as a divisor or you are using a particular depreciation rate already. Okay? Letter D, the gross carrying amount and the accumulated depreciation. Okay? Pertaining to the aggregated accumulated impairment losses also at the beginning and the end of the period. So meaning uh, by how much did the depreciation and impairment losses change. And letter E, a reconciliation of the carrying amount at the beginning and end of the period showing okay, the details for additions, for assets held for sale, for additional acquisitions okay, due to business combination, for increases or decreases resulting from revaluations or impairments, for the impairment loss recognized in profit or loss, also for impairment losses reversal, for depreciation itself, for the translation adjustments in the case of foreign operations, and for other changes. So in other words, you need to provide a detailed um, computation or a detailed uh, pre a presentation of, of the changes okay, between the beginning and ending balance of your property plant and equipment. Okay, aside from that, you need also to disclose the following. First, the existence and the amounts of restrictions on title uh, and property, plant, and equipment pledges okay, as security for liability. So in case there are uh, PPEs that were or used as collateral or those that are subject to encumbrances. Letter B, the amount of expenditures recognized in the carrying amount of an item of PPE in the course of its construction. Okay, so you need to give a detail of the construction so that we can check whether you correctly capitalized only those items that should be capitalized. And the amount of contractual commitments for the acquisition of property, plant, and equipment for full disclosure purposes so that we know if the entity plans to buy, construct, or uh, acquire new PPE in the future. In addition, if not presented separately in the, in in the statement of comprehensive income, the financial statement shall also disclose the following. The amount of compensation from third parties for items of property, plant, and equipment that were impaired, lost, or given up. So meaning this is in the case of compensation for impairment. And the amounts of proceeds and costs included in profit or loss that relate to items produced that are not an output of the entity's ordinary activities in which... Uh, and which line items in the statement of comprehensive income include such proceeds and costs. So usually this pertains to other incidental income that we derive from operating the PPE such as insurance contracts or whatever. Okay? So usually this, the insurance contract will... Um, those are the usual examples of other incidental items that we will get from uh, as, as proceeds from the operation of our PPE. Like example, when the PPE suddenly malfunctioned, then there will be an insurance contract and there is an insurance contract involved, there will be compensation for that. So it is not necessarily impairment, but rather it is uh, an amount that we receive from the, uh, from the insurance of the PPE. Okay? So similarly, if let's say for example, you have a car and the car has a comprehensive insurance, if in case you got something, from the insurance company as a result of the insurance contract between you and the insurance company, then you need to disclose that. So, okay. Other uh, disclosures. If items of PPE are stated at revalued amounts, meaning if you are using revaluation method, you need to disclose the following as required by IFRS 13. First, the effective date of the revaluation so that there will be a basis of when you determine the fair value. Letter B, whether the in, an independent valuer was involved. This is correct, letter E and letter F, because provisions letter C and letter D were already eliminated as a result of the provisions of IFRS 13. So A, B, E, and F are those that are remaining. Letter E, so you can simply uh, consider this as four additional disclosures because the two disclosures were already deleted. So for each revalued class of PPE, the carrying amount that would have been recognized had the asset been carried under the cost model so that you can 
justify the amount of revaluation surplus and the revaluation surplus indicating the change for the period and any restriction on the distribution of the balance to shareholders okay because it is possible that um any amount of revaluation surplus cannot be used or declared as um declared as dividend later on because take note revaluation surplus when it is already realized will be close to retained earnings and retained earnings can be used uh, and uh, will generally be used or will be deducted or will be reduced whenever there is dividend declaration so you need to provide also if the amount that was transferred from revaluation surplus to retained earnings is restricted as to uh, dividends so you need to provide that also if in case there are so these are additional disclosures and with that that's the end of the presentation for the basic provisions of your property plan and equipment so generally there will be no problem with the capitalization and the depreciation okay, as well as the revaluation because these are very straightforward items okay, you already learned them particularly during your uh, lower years okay, so you simply need to recall the processes that are involved doing that 